G'day YouTubers, how you all going? My name's Wilfred West, Wilfred's PC World, Lakeside Cottage in Locksport, Victoria, Australia. Today's date is the 16th of the 3rd, 2015, and it's 28 past 9 in the morning. And I'm recording this with the GoPro Hero 3 camera, with wide settings, and the resolution is 1920 by 1080, um, at 20, oh, 20, 29 frames per second. Well, I hope you like this video, and if so, please subscribe. forward slash news radio our new web poll has just gone up we're asking you should the federal government abandon its attempt to deregulate the university bloody oath now that most crossbenchers are unlikely to support oh, the now, this current is reform so have your say at abc.net.au forward slash news radio and if our mum now time has crossed the line to federal parliament with Canberra on analogue they can be broadcasting from the house of representatives so stay with us for that right now though it's time to Thank you. 
New Zealand. Gisborne Council's Sheridan Guntry says more than 40 people have been evacuated from the area and more on the impact as it comes to hand. To other news now, a federal coalition backbencher has broken ranks. To... And musician Elton John is calling for a boycott of Italian fashion designers Dolce & Gabbana after they used an interview with the Italian media to criticise same-sex families and IVF. <laughs> Let's get more now on those reports that three British teenagers have been detained in Turkey while they were planning to enter Syria to join the Islamic State group. Police say the two boys aged 17 from northwest London and a man at the age of 19 have now returned to the UK and are in police custody. Just last month, three British London schoolgirls flew undetected into Istanbul where it's feared they've now crossed over the border and joined IS. The BBC's Selin Gerrits is in Istanbul. We now know that these three boys uh, have actually been deported yesterday night to London, to the UK, and they are being held in a location in central London, apparently. On Friday, they went missing, and uh, it seems that this time, Turkish officials were quickly informed about the case, and they were arrested, detained, and were deported very quickly. Turkey was criticized very often of not taking enough measures to prevent foreign jihadists from going across into Syria to join IS ranks. And British officials, you might remember that, for instance, the Deputy Prime Minister Grant Ogunch had said last month when the three girls, three UK school girls went missing, he complained about the lack of cooperation between the British and the Turkish intelligence services and blamed Britain for not being able to locate and stop these girls from going across into Syria. And apparently it seems British and Turkish police have cooperated and British police have detained these boys and sent them back to the UK. I just want to underline that, although there's been so much attention on the case of the three young girls that you mentioned. This time we're talking about male teenagers. Yes, this is, this is a different case apparently in that sense. Uh, for instance, these three young girls, when they, if, if they made their way back into the UK, uh, it was said, Scotland Yard has said that they wouldn't be arrested or detained under terrorism charges, for instance, because they were considered as missing cases. But these three boys are held uh, with terrorism charges, but no charge has yet been made, of course. That's the BBC's Selim Gedit speaking there with Andrew Peach. Well, we've also seen cases of young Australians being radicalised and then lured into taking up the fight of Islamic State militants in Syria and Iraq. Just last week, Melbourne teenager Jake Bellardi was reportedly killed in a suicide attack in Iraq after apparently joining the extremist group. Well, a forum is taking place in Western Sydney tonight to discuss just how young Muslims perceive religious extremism and ways to counter it. One of the speakers at the event, called Radical Appeal of Young People and Religious Extremism, is the CEO of the United Muslim Women Association, Maha Abdo, and she joins us now. Thanks very much for joining us on ABC News Radio. Now, how much of a concern is the radicalisation of young Muslims here in Australia for the community, and, and do we know just how common it is? Lunch. Oh, 
perhaps that is a deliberate signal on this symbolic day that the French way of life will prevail. Barbara Miller reporting there. Time now to take you to the House of Representatives on our analogue in Canberra. Issues of the Labor government, and you want to see what the impact of their policy decisions had. There were 519,000 jobs that went missing in the small business category. That's about 1,600 a week. Uh, Minister Bilson has worked hard on reforming the National Franchising Code. Once again, a logical place, franchising, where people make a move from employee to employer. But they need certainty in legislation, and Minister Bilson is delivering on this. The Competition Policy Review, the government has taken important steps towards ensuring that the competition framework is effective for all businesses by undertaking an independent group and branch review. And there will be more announced on this as we proceed in government. The free trade agreements. Minister Roth has uh, Japan and Korea's free trade agreements came into, into effect in uh, December and January. China's will come into effect later in the year. These are amazing opportunities for small and family businesses to reach out to the other side of the world and, and deliver products and services and create jobs. We've established a $482 billion entrepreneurs infrastructure program. Uh, the infrastructure in Western Sydney, the hard capital infrastructure, with uh, Premier Bay, the second Sydney airport, the 35,000 jobs that this will create, the road infrastructure, West Connects, which is the most important piece of transport infrastructure to be delivered and will make a massive difference in the lives of all within the room and, and unlock, in terms of route, Parramatta Road. Madam Speaker, we can never stop, we can never talk about the role that small and family business plays in this place enough. We should not only do so with every opportunity, we should understand that it is the major economic driver, always has been, always will be, of our economy. We should aim policy to help improve the, the lives of not only those in the community, but the lives of those that they employ. Now I can bring this motion to the House. Thank you, Madam Julie Owens, who is the Shadow Parliamentary Secretary for Small Business in this House as well, particularly the one that the Liberal Party is the government of small business. Um, if it was, I'm sure that the member for Reef would have spent more time talking about the actual achievements of the government in relation to small business rather than um, a large amount of time on the very nice statements we all support small business. Um, a, a, a relatively large time bagging the Labor Party as the government seems to like to do more than anything else rather than deliver, just the bag us. It seems to be the answer to everything at the moment. And then to talk about some of the promises they made, but not to be able to talk about hardly any actual delivered policy for small business. So it's not surprising that when you look at how business is actually feeling under this government, it doesn't match the rhetoric of this government being a government for small business. The Australian Chamber for Commerce and Industry recently, recently did its major small business survey for 2014 and it found the index of expected economic performance fell markedly for the fourth consecutive quarter and has now been below a 50 reading for three quarters in a row. It also revealed that small business is expecting future decreases in profit. Again, for a government that claims to be about small business, small business is not feeling the love at the moment. When you look at the issues of concern to small business, it tells a completely different story to the one we just heard from the member for Reed. Business taxes and government charges return to the number one constraint on small business under this government. After being replaced by insufficient demand for one quarter, it's back on the top. Insufficient demand has steadily gained in importance since 2012 um, and suggests tepid demand limiting the ability of small businesses to grow in 2014. Import competition gained in importance as a business constraint moving from fifth to third. Perhaps some of the free trade agreements that the government scrutes are so good, which, for which we still haven't heard the detail. If they were that good, Madam Speaker, I would suggest that we might know the detail. But import competition has risen up the scale as an issue um, of concern to business from fifth to third. Non-wage labour costs jumped from eighth to fourth place and federal government regulations return to the top 10 in fifth place in spite of the rhetoric that this government spruiks on a daily basis about reducing red costs, so the red tape costs. So the, the way that business is actually experiencing this 
government, as demonstrated by this survey, is completely in contrast to the, to the rhetoric of this government about what they are doing for small business. So let's have a look at why small business might not be feeling the love from this government. Let's look at what they have actually done for small business. And I use the word done rather than achieved because most of it is not positive. One of the first things they did is they abolished the instant asset write-off. Along with a number of other um, tax um, benefits that they've abolished, there was over $4 billion tax hike for small business um, delivered in that first year of government. Over $4 billion tax hike for small business. The largest chunk of that came from the repealing of the instant tax write-off, $2.9 billion in assistance to small business. $2.9 billion gone gone in that first year. Not only was it gone, Madam Speaker, it's been benefited, benefited um, from that program. Again, cut $650 million. Um, the Labor government had introduced quarterly payments um, for R&D, and this government abolished those also retrospectively. So again, companies that thought they would be receiving their R&D benefits on a quarterly basis suddenly found them revert to annual. Um, an, an incredible um, difficulty in terms of cash flow for small business. This is from a government that claims to be in favour of small business, that claims to be the government of small business, that proudly says that all of the speakers today actually come from small businesses. Well, if you come from small businesses, sorry, Madam Speaker, if they come from small businesses, then you'd expect them to understand the importance of certainty. They certainly talk about certainty, they certainly don't deliver it. Four billion dollars in tax cuts came to small, in tax hikes came to small business in that first year of this government with the most absolutely incompetent, incompetent implementations of businesses didn't even nice, know nice that the decisions vote. they were making today would be made invalid tomorrow through changes to the tax law. Um, it's really quite extraordinary, Madam Speaker. And then, of course, let's look at the NBN. Look what the government has done to the NBN, Madam Speaker. You know, we, we had a plan in place to deliver high-speed broadband across Australia. Madam Speaker, I was in a yeah, small I town called Kimbokan um, um, a couple of years ago trying Tony to buy um, some uh, beautiful coffee cups from an art gallery in Kimbokan. And the poor business owner, and I say the poor business owner because I couldn't believe what he was going through. He was using dial-up. He took half an hour to take my credit card transaction because it kept cutting out. And eventually he went and stood in the middle of the field where he knew he could get signal in order to take my money. Now, there are very if I hadn't absolutely understood that this appalling circumstance of having a customer wait for half an hour just to take their money um, was absolutely not his fault. <laughs> if I wasn't feeling really sorry for him at that time, I probably would have walked out. I doubt that I would stand in a, a city and wait half an hour um, to actually pay. But in this case, I did. Now, what is this government doing for this business? Copper to up the road? The fibre up the road and copper to his to his gallery a kilometre from the main road? What? <laughs> How on earth can we expect Australian businesses to thrive with a third yeah, rate, a third rate uh, of what with this, this government is delivering? In my electorate, we need to vote Adam, Tony Abbott out which and is put Labor the back in CBD so we can get national broadband back, on, back on track. Um, um, Western Sydney and Parramatta is the capital of it. It's considered to be the second CBD. We have a government that's so committed to delivering 25 megabits per second by the end of their first term, which is a year and a half away. But Parramatta is not even on the list at the moment. It was on the list. There were supposed to be 62,000 houses with fibre to the home during this term of government. It's been removed. Parramatta has been moved down the list. And it's not on the list at all. So nothing is going to happen in Parramatta between now and the next election. And I can tell you, because I've surveyed my electorate, that average speeds in, in Westmead, for example, 8.5 per second on download, yeah, less than one on upload. Um, North Mead, which is a 10-minute drive from the CBD, um, is 10.5. Wow. Um, Carlingford's 10.2. The fastest is Parramatta, which is 
meet more than 25 megabits for small business? I don't think so. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Hughes. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Craig Kelly, Liberal, New South Wales.
inheriting the mess, the debt and deficit legacy that we've done, but we're getting on that job, Deputy Speaker. The most important thing we can do is in the areas of competition policy, Deputy Speaker, the areas of price discrimination. I look forward to our report, our root and branch review to be I take the motion. member. The question is the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Oxley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and uh, I, I look curiously at these uh, motions put up by the Liberal Party, and I wonder why it is they need to remind themselves that uh, small and medium business are the engine room of the economy because then when they get a chance to speak they come in here and the only budget they've doubled is the attack on labour budget uh, rather than actually talking about what they've actually done for small business which of course is very very little uh, the only thing they've done in, in great my name's Wilfred West Wilfred's PC World Lakeside Cottage in Logsport Victoria Australia signing off thank you for watching my videos and all comments are welcome I love listening to the pollies I like listening to children <laughs> you all have a great day everyone.